Is this your king? A refutation of Phil Valentine. Party people in place to be. I go by the name of the BK Apologist, transmitting all the way live. New York is the city, Brooklyn is the borough. What's good? What's popping? Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, let's say what's up to the party people in the chat. And when I say the party people, I mean Nate 2D2, of course, is the first and only participant in the chat as of right now. <laughs> what's going on, Nate? Um, he is the as, party, he is the party. He always brings the party. I mean, that's just facts. Um, for those who appreciate, besides Nate, um, what goes down here at the BK Apologist, you can show your support via PayPal. Or if you'd like to be a monthly supporter, which Nate already is, you can become a Patreon where you get an assortment of goodies to enhance your personal Bible study. Oh, and we got Crimson Hulk in the place to be. All right, what's going on? What's going on? That's and, a dope. Uh, that's a dope name, Crimson that's Hulk. That's a dope name. Very oh, because it was a there was a Red Hulk, right? There was a Red Hulk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was a couple colors actually. Yeah, you got gray. You got the gray, gray Hulk, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, but um, got some interesting partners here. Ready to rock and roll. We got Mister True ID himself, Adam Coleman. What's going on, sir? Hey, doing well, man. Doing well. Just liking and sharing the video, as I hope folks in the chat are. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, yep, yep, man. Yep. And of course, we have from the other side of the Mason Dixon line with that Southern hospitality, uh, MJ Jackson. Greetings. Greetings. Um, <laughs> Phil, Scott. Just ready to get, deal with Phil Valentine. Been waiting quite a long time to say a few things about this dude. <laughs> Yeah, so for those yeah. who are curious, I am com um, commenting a a series entitled, <laughs> is, is This Your King? And basically what we'll be doing is we're going to look at some of the, the legends, the godfathers of the conscious community, and we're going to give our, our commentary in the way the UA does best, you know? And the first individual on the chopping block is quote-unquote doctor phil valentine did, did so, you say do doctor well i, I said quote-unquote i put quotations <laughs> i put quotations all right so gentlemen what are you familiar with mr valentine like what are your 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 thoughts about this particular individual yo phil valentine this is my quick take on him phil valentine is the keith murray wow of the conscious community wow Break that down. Keith Murray. If you if you listen to Phil, to his credit, to his credit, you know what I'm saying? He he flexes a very broad vocabulary that I think creates the the impression that he knows more than what he actually does. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is his vocabulary hey, that that's that's like his kind of that, that's his niche, I guess you can say, like his delivery. You know, he's got he uses a bunch of big words oftentimes incorrectly you know what i mean um but i think he just try to try to wow the crowd if you will you know what I mean with, with the verbiage and keith murray kind of reminds me of that i mean keith murray with right, right. some made-up word lyrical miracle you know abidextric you know just, whatever you know what i mean right right that was right, keith right. murray you say but but it was but the flow was ill you know what i'm saying like you know so that's kind of you know keith keith uh murray had an ill delivery I'm saying you know valentine has an ill delivery but no substance you know what i mean no that's facts i mean and he is one of the templates. Like a lot of guys that we hear today, they get that whole swag from Mr. Valentine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Actually, I remember I was going back and forth with Shaka Atmos um, on on uh, on a post. Matter of fact, MJ Jackson, you remember this? Like when he first popped up there under his, his government name, Alex. You know what I mean? And this is not a diss. This is, I'm not. This is not a shot. This, this, I'm only referencing this because Alex, because it happened. And. Um, so I, I remember I said to him that when it comes to vocabulary, when, when you have when you flex a strong vocabulary without the logic and reason to go with it, it's like not taking a bath and not taking a shower 
and trying to put deodorant <laughs> under your arms. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> all you do is create a worse thing. So it's, it's not going to work, fam. You got to bathe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Likewise, right. you can't get away from logic and reason. You know, um, and again, that's not a shot. I'm just referencing when I made that statement. So, I'm, I'm just wondering. right, right. MJ, what what are your thoughts about the good? Yeah, I, li- I like the way uh, Phil Valentine weaves his 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 curse words with his vocabulary. <laughs> Uh, he, he's a he's a pepper for sure. No, I'm joking about that. But yeah, uh, Phil Valentine is a character, and yeah, I mean he he has some rhetorical skills. He, he's a performer, okay. And I say that that is a little disrespectful. What I'm saying, there's more performance in what he does than there is any type of accurate information. Um, and you know, once again, if you've been watching this channel. You've already seen uh, BK kind of pull the veil, you know, and show that the emperor has no clothes in terms of the sources that these dudes use. So at this point, you know, we just kind of go and wait for it. <laughs> you no, know, and, and, and you guys, if you if you've been following this channel, you'll know the the uh, the punchlines that we're looking for: the Council of Nicaea, mm. uh, Hermes Tresmegistus, uh, right. Uh, the mystery, you, you know, you, you're gonna, uh, it's 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 gonna become like clockwork at this point. Now nah, these are facts. I mean, he is. I mean, to give him some credit here, he's really good at the oratory flourishes. Like he's really good, very captivating. He's very entertaining. You know, he's quick on his feet with it. You know, um, you know, polite definitely went to his school of, of delivery. You know. Um, the young pharaohs, like they all try to mimic this guy in some way, shape, style, or fashion. You know what I mean? So, but um, with that being said, we're going to do a, a little commentary on one of his magnum opus tape series, which is the metaphysics of the Bible. It is a six hour tape series that we will not do in its entirety today. <laughs> In fact, we're just gonna do a couple of clips and that's it. We're not gonna do a whole thing on it's six hours, fam. It's like man, when you when you sent me that video, when I first opened that video, I got scared. I'm like, yo, <laughs> is this man really trying to like comb through six hours? I was like, yo, nah, I, I can't even watch nah, this joint. This is crazy. Nah, I couldn't. Yeah, I was I like, yo, this is gonna be a 20 hour rebuttal. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, oh my goodness. That's he came and lost his mind. He's trying to get views for real. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, man, we're going to go to the video. Um, Adam, if you can go, we're going to start at the one minute mark, please. Mm-hmm. Inject some new information, deep provocateur, especially to my younger brothers and sisters who might be here or who might be privy to this tape. Again, I say, I am not now, nor never have I been a prognosticator, promoter, student, scholar, or follower of Dr. Malachi York. All information herein disseminated or discussed is based upon my years, 20 and more, of investigation and scholarship into realms of metaphysics, into teachings, spirituality, and so forth. Any similarity and we can stop there so he is telling us up front that he has 20 years <laughs> of investigation in metaphysics and spirituality right 20 years, we, 20 we, years. we've heard this claim recently right that 20 years of this this mastery of this subject right so I, once again because he put himself out there as a expert, somebody who is, you know, well entrenched in the subject matter, we don't have to be that charitable with Mr. Valentine. You know what I mean? Like we we don't have to because up right. front he is telling us 20 years worth of investigative research. Right? So, I mean, am I don't Am I wrong for feeling that way or or, or what, gentlemen? Now, nah, you could take it easy on a man, you know. Yeah. Okay. Now, nah, he said 20 years. He, he also said that this information 
is in, in a certain sense original to him. This information that he's getting ready to bring out. He said he's conducted the research. He has. So once again, if we come across some information that has already been debunked or exp- that we've already exposed, I mean, you know, we're going to have some questions for this brother. Right. Uh, this, ma- this, this master but, teacher. Right. And he is considered right. a master teacher. He is in, in this community. He is one of the grand masters. Grand dragons. You know what I mean? He's one of those <laughs> yeah, guys. Right. He's considered OG grand master. Yeah, I mean, he really yeah. is, man. Like, I mean, just for context, like, he, he's in that class of, like, the Bobby Hemmets and the, the Dr. Benz and in terms of where he comes along chronologically compared to many of the people that we're dealing with today. Like, he's he's in that bag, you know, of being one of the OGs. I thought it was interesting. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I agree with you, BK, that you know, we don't have to pull punches uh, because he he's saying he's that dude. He's done 20 years of investigative study. Like, he, you know, you know, as MJ said, this information that's original to him. And I think it's interesting. I don't know the context. I wonder like, what was going on at the time to where he felt the need to clarify that he had not got his information from Dr. Malachi Zoo York. You know, I'm inclined to think that there must have been some scuttlebutt or buzz at the time, you know, saying that he must have gotten it from them. And so he's trying to clarify this point. I'm guessing because he's trying to market this particular tape series uh, at the outset. He's trying to, you know, it's like you're trying to avoid copyright infringement or something along those lines. You know what I mean? But he's saying, no, I didn't get it from Dr. Dior. This, this is all me, fam. This is all me. So if you got a critique, the bullseye is, is right here. That, that's what yep. he's saying. Yep. And I appreciate that. That's that's good. That's good. So from there, um, Mr. Coleman, let's go to the Whenever eight minute mark. Theology and theocracy are both mindsets. Theocracy has you laboring under the misapprehension that there is a vicarious atonement at the end of your dedicated service towards this particular ideology. Now what is a vicarious atonement? Vicarious atonement means that you believe that someone else is going to come and get rid of all your woes and all of your problems. Vicarious atonement is the basis of Christianity. Vicarious atonement tells me that Jesus Christ has suffered every ill and every problem and everything that you would have suffered. Therefore, belief in this structure of thought will therefore... What is it? Guarantee me happiness at the end. All right, let me stop there. So, Please. gentlemen, <laughs> um, how wrong is he about vicarious atonement? <laughs> well, well, first of all, can we backtrack to theocracy? Can we start there? Because because he says that theocracy, in some sense, you know, involves this notion of vicarious atonement, and those are two distinct theological concepts right? right so for example um when you when you're talking about um you can even look at, at the old testament if you will you're know saying like the, the israelites the israelite nation lived under a theocracy theor- theoretically speaking or excuse me in principle they, they were ruled by god if you will you know what i'm saying that's you know it wasn't like a, a a republic like you know we have or like you know communist you know they they were a theocracy you know god was was in charge so to speak right um but that would have been the case, what, well over a millennium before you know Jesus comes along and executes like the, you know the the uh, what he refers to as the vicarious atonement. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> but anyway, you, you can. My point is, you can have a theocracy, meaning a system of government where the belief is that God is is in rulership. You can have a theocracy without any kind of. Um, belief in some sort of vicarious atonement, what he refers to as vicarious atonement. Those are two distinct theological uh, perspectives. And they, they don't, one doesn't entail the other. You know what I'm saying? You don't need one to have the other. You know what I'm saying? You could have vic- so-called vicarious atonement without theocracy. You could have a theocracy without some sort of belief in a vicarious atonement. So it just at the outset, this is what I was talking about. Like using big words, 
and using them incorrectly, and there's just no substance. He's just throwing stuff out, hoping that you won't catch it. Yeah, I know you got something to say, MJ. I'm, I'm gonna fall back. Yeah, people like him, and you know, I, I look, I love folks in my own family, but you know, uh, I, I came across uh, a post by um, a relative of mine, and this person has been, uh, you know, susceptible to cultic thinking this past year. And I began to question them and warn them about you know, spreading heresy, things like that. So there is this attitude um, that people should be able to say whatever they want to say and not be questioned. And a person sounds real good until you question them. And I think uh, I think it's in the Proverbs where it talks about the person who who speaks first, uh, you know, sounding good until they till they're cross examined. And so just like Adam Coleman just said, this dude is already throwing out big words out there. He, he's making up his own meaning. And, you know, talk about something not having a basis in reality. Um, he's a, he's attaching different meanings to words already. And so if if you if, if you sitting there in the audience, you are already getting bamboozled by, by this huckster. And I'm sorry, I know it's going to be offensive to some people. But just like what Adam Coleman just said, a theocracy, right? We we have Christian nationalists right now advocating for a theocracy, knowing that everybody in America ain't saved, but they want a theocracy anyway. Mm. Come on now, I thought, I thought I thought I thought you <laughs> were smart. Well, and, in effect, I would just throw this in too. Yeah. What about Islam, right? You know what I'm saying like if you are an Islamist, if you're like true blue. Then you believe that the the way the things should be, it should be a caliphate. Like it should, everything should be under the order of Allah. You know what I mean? And, you know, down to the Sharia laws and everything. Like Allah should run it all. You know, that's what you believe. So you know that that is, in a sense, a, a theocracy. You know, according to to them anyway. You know what I mean? But obviously, they don't. They would not <laughs> subscribe to a vicarious uh, uh, atonement because they don't believe that Jesus even died. And let me say you know this mean, too. To, to, to tone for anything. You see what I'm saying? So those two beliefs are different. Those two theological yeah. perspectives are totally yeah. independent yeah. of one another. Yeah. Right. Just real quick, Christians don't believe in a vicarious atonement. We believe in a substitutionary atonement. We, we believe in a substitutionary atonement. So if you, right. once again, this goes for, for any newcomer seeking to take up the mantle of Phil. After, after this video, somebody going to try to take the mantle up. Because he's about to get busted up. Well, I it, mean, the term <laughs> the term is similar to it's it's it goes you know somewhat, but he still gets it wrong anyway. Because as, as Dean New says, you know, words have to mean what they mean, right? Terms have to mean what they mean. Because he's saying that this atonement is God taking away all our woes, right? And that he's been through. Like he's dealt with every evil thing that we've been through. Like that's not what atonement is at all, you know. Um, but vicarious atonement is the idea that Jesus Christ took the place of mankind, suffering the penalty of sin. He didn't sin with us. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like that's that's not what happened here. Atonement is a term meaning reconciliation or amends. Vicarious means done in place of or instead of someone else. So in literal terms, the Christian concept of vicarious atonement is that Jesus was substituted for humanity and punished for our faults. He didn't do what we did, all right? He didn't do what we did in order to pay for the sins we had committed and reconcile us to God. Vicarious atonement is also referred to as substitutionary atonement or penal substitution. So it's not that, you know, he... Like, you know, if I had a drinking problem, Jesus jumped in and also had a drinking problem with me. And that's what, like, that's not what happened here at all. In fact, in, in Hebrews 4, 15, right, it says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Without sin. Second Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He also says something about, you know, waiting to the end to see if we, we get saved. 
no Christians waiting to be saved. Right? We we are saved. And, and in fact, it's 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 a little paradoxical, right? Because it's we are saved, but we're also in the process of being saved at the same time. What what do I mean by that? Well, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one no one may boast. We are already saved. If you have pledged your allegiance to Yeshua HaMashiach, you are already saved. But at the same time, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, Christ, the wisdom and power of God, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And um, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. And sanctification, right? It was a hagiosmos. It's the process of advancing in holiness. So we're already saved. But even as we are saved, we are in the process of sanctification. We're becoming more like Yeshua, hopefully, as time progresses. So that in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So as Christians, we are saved. We are the process of sanctification so that we have something to look forward to that will be revealed in the last time. Now, for Mr. Valentine to completely misconstrue the epicenter of our theology completely discredits him critiquing Christianity. Absolutely. Absolutely. You get the cross wrong. Stop talking about Christianity. Just, just stop it, fam. Your thoughts, gentlemen. No, I mean that's exactly right, man. And um, I think just as a quick note, like when you're engaging in apologetics, just or just having a conversation with people about worldviews and whatever, you know, one of the main things you're going to do when, when somebody comes at you with, with a critique, a lot of times it's just to to refute or to kind of undercut their critique. A lot of times it's just a matter of pointing out where they've gotten our theology wrong. You know what I'm saying like and and not allowing somebody to advance the advance the conversation on the basis of a misunderstanding of our theology, right? I'm not going to defend something that I don't believe. You know what I mean? I do not believe that in this notion of vicarious atonement, in the sense that Jesus is taking up how are he phrased? You know, like just taking on everything bad, and then somehow you know I have to submit to this. What he refers to as a structural thought, and <laughs> whatever that means. Yeah, like however he articulated it, that's not what I believe, and that's that's not what it's not just what I believe. That's not with what uh, Orthodox Christianity is. Like you've misrepresented Christianity. So at the outset, a lot of times, you know, just really pointing out things like that can really help you to pivot and help you to navigate a conversation. It's like, bro, like you got to get the theology right. If you if you to your point, uh, BK, if you can't get the cross right, if you can't correctly articulate our position in regard to the cross. Then my confidence on your end of the conversation is super low at that yep. point. <laughs> like I have zero confidence that this is going to be a productive conversation. But yeah, MJ, what you got, man? Uh, no, I, I agree with <laughs> I agree with everything y'all just said. Uh, just about sitting back and not being so eager to tear up an argument that's not touching anything that you believe. So so yeah, sometimes you just got to hang back and you know let them lengthen that rope out and then you know just pull the chair from under it and you know and if you've been in this channel you know we've talked about the fallacy of the straw man creating your own version of the belief system and knocking that down you know and that's exactly what he's doing here you know he made up his own version he this it's not the 616 universe it's the 638 universe christianity you know what I mean? It's not ours. 
that's somewhere else that he's talking about, you know, and, and to Adam's point, you know, if you're going to critique me, critique what I believe. Don't create something and then try to force that on me. Like, that's not what I believe at all. I'm not waiting to be saved. I'm waiting for the Lord to come get me. Yeah, but I'm already saved. I'm waiting in expectation as a saved person. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm not waiting to be saved. You know, the only people that really teach that are the One Westers and the SCAs. They teach that, that no one is saved until the very end. Christianity proper, no matter what denomination, we all agree that once you pledge allegiance and have faith in Jesus, you're in. All right? So with that, uh, Mr. Coleman, we could go to the 12 minute mark. What you do is take that vicarious atonement and it the smoke. It is time for us as an elevated humanity, as a growing humanity, as a gestating spirit God to get out of the belief orientation that we have been functioning under for the last 2,000 years. We have been taking storybook mythology that essentially was written under the cloak of a very high science and through supernaturalism have perverted reason and perverted logic. Now I have made a series of notes here that I'm going to be reading so that I can get along with putting this information down and then for us to exchange so that we can go from point A, which is theocracy, to point Z, which is the technocracy, and you will see how they are linked. Those of you who are students of the Bible or who know of people who are students of the Bible, this will not support any of the contentions that Jesus is coming to save us. You will not feel comfortable with this tape. You will not feel comfortable in the circle of people who are discussing through reason and logic the fact that your salvation is based upon what you do, not what is done for you by some vicarious savior that will come down on a puff of smoke and take up his chosen few. That is the biggest lie that we propagate under today. But with the technology that Christianity now has at their disposal, don't be surprised if you see Jesus on a cloud. Don't be surprised if you see him stepping out of a spaceship to come and take his 144,000 chosen. Because they will have orchestrated it that way. Remember, we are now functioning under a paradigm of illusion based upon a thinking context that was seeded into your mind as a genetic factor over 2,000 years ago. You are participating in a lie. You are participating in an agreement. It is time to break the agreement with reason, with logic. Most of this information you can find from certain writers, European Maybe writers, stop. who got hold of a lot of our information. All right, so. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, I, man, I don't even know where to go with it, man. I, I was really, I'm really tripping off this idea. He said that um, this mode of belief or whatever has was seeded into you as a genetic factor. Man, I wish we had D New up here, man. I, I really want, I really would love for D New to, to come on here and explain <laughs> how somebody seeded into the entirety of the Western world, all who, who I guess, I guess, yeah, I guess like everybody, how they seeded. You know, two thousand years ago, how they seeded it, you know this idea of belief or whatever the theocracy or whatever as a genetic factor. That's that. I, I really, I would love for him to explain that. I would love for him to explain it. That that is what you call. Um, that's just flat out bamboozery. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that's, that's where you just, you just making stuff up. That's that Jedi, right. Jedi mind trick. You know what I mean? Type of deal. Right. That, that trickology. You know what I mean? That, that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's what that is, bro. It's that trickology, bro. I mean, I mean, I mean, some stuff. I'm telling you, some stuff doesn't even warrant a response. It's just, it's just like, man, that's just, that's just garbage. I'm not even gonna say what I really want to say. But it's, it's just like, bro, like that's, I'm not gonna say what. Not first you, Alan. That's, no, that just, that's that Brooklyn magic. That's right? that Brooklyn magic, right? That's what you're magic, bro. What are you talking about? 
it was it was seen into you as a genetic factor. Man, what are you, bro? Man, get out of here, bro. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, man, go ahead. Man. I mean, I th- I think I know what he's going to say um, here soon. But I mean, I mean, the man is clearly weaving his words, man. Like seriously, and and you know, it's an illusion. This is some Donald Trump type stuff right here that this dude is engaging in. Uh, Jesus, if you, you you're going to see Jesus, but it's an illusion. Like, come on, man. He's already poisoning the well. So, ba- I mean, you. It's like Adam just said, something doesn't even warrant a response except to say that this dude is on something, clearly, and it's good. It's really good. Remember, 20 years of investigative (laughs) research. He is a legend in this community. He is a master teacher, guru of knowledge. Okay? Remember that. And also, so right off the bat, right, no Christian has a contention about Jesus coming back. We have a conviction about Jesus coming back. He's using the word wrong. No one has oh, a contention. I didn't even catch that. That's true. Right, right, right. No Christian has a contention. We have a conviction, right? And then he brings up the whole spaceship, 144,000. I'm like, we're not Hebrew Israelites, fam. And before any any Hebrews get on my case, okay, all Hebrews don't believe that. Granted, the one Westerners do. The spaceship coming down to only pick up one hundred forty-four thousand. Really, like you don't read the next line in in the book. <laughs> You're not Muslims either. You don't read the twenty years, next line time, in that twenty years of, of study. He didn't have time to get to that next line. I don't in, understand. In he was too busy dodging that genetic factor. That's why. That's why he was dipping right, and dodging right. for you know he's doing the matrix move on the genetic factors. <laughs> right. So right, right. now he also talks about like you know basically Christianity perpetrating a a lie a, a fraud right. So a fraud is any activity that relies on deception <clears throat> in order to achieve a gain. Fraud becomes a crime when it is knowing misrepresentation of the truth or concealment of a material fact to induce another to act in his or her determined. In other words, if you lie in order to deprive a person or organization of their money or property, they you have committed fraud. Now, have people under the guise of Christianity committed this, this, this atrocious act? Absolutely. But is it Christianity? No, it's not. It's not biblical to commit fraud. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. Zephaniah um, chapter 1, verse 9. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. In James 5, starting in verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Revelation 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So the Bible is very anti-deceit, anti-fraud, all right? And a lot of people, unfortunately, they conflate what people do in the name of Christianity with the actual teachings of Christ. Sometimes they're one and the same. A lot of times they are not. And the only way that you would know is if you know your Bible. You can't just go by what people say. Adam could say he's a plumber all day long. But if all he does is make paper planes, is he a plumber? No. No. So you guys got anything? uh, You want to add anything before we continue? 
I'm not a plumber. But if I did claim <laughs> to be a plumber, I guarantee you, I, I, Adam Coltman is closer to being a plumber than this man it was to 20 years of <laughs> 20 years of in-depth study. I tell you that right. I, I tell you what's fraudulent was that 20 years of study. That's not <laughs> fraudulent. I'm telling you that right now, bro. This man, come on, bro. Come on, man. It's crazy. You gotta stop. You gotta stop. All right, we're gonna actually we're gonna keep playing from where where we stop. So okay. A lot of the comedic information, a lot of the Vedic information, and processed it, did a good job of it. But they themselves were ostracized. One of them, particularly, a man whose surname or who pen named himself as Hilton Holtimer, which is Dr. Really J.R. Clemens. He wrote over 146 different folios on the initiation process as it was deemed through the comedic literature or what you call the ancient mystery system. I suggest that any of you brothers and sisters who have access to Hilton Potemus folios. Uh, sister can hold that up and let them see some of the folios. Brothers in the back who have the tapes and the books, they can be seen. Um, Hilton Potemus folios, um, a book, excellent book, from which I will be using some of the, the pre-context of the videotape series by Lloyd Graham, known as the uh, Myths of the Bible. All the myths and deceptions of the Bible. Excellent work. It's not new. Everything he's saying is not new. He has borrowed extensively if you read his bibliography. All of his bibliography will lead you to all of the sources. And I say that to the young brothers and sisters too. All right. So he actually does cite two sources. But before we get to that, I find it interesting that well, now I am not a, a an author. You guys have published works, so you guys are better to answer this than I am. Um, when you have a bibliography or endnotes, are you borrowing? Are you stealing when you have a bibliography? I mean, I don't know. You guys tell me. <laughs> right. I, I knew. I, I was. Uh, I didn't know you. Were, I didn't know you were going to go there. You know what I'm saying? But it's funny. But I picked up on the same thing too. He, he doesn't seem to understand how bibliographies work. You know. So, <clears throat> actually, a little small flex here. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I did contribute. You know, to this work right here, Urban Apologetics: Restoring Black Dignity with the Gospel. Um, you know, shout out to the team. They got actually volume two coming out on June twentieth of this year. So y'all make sure y'all go ahead and. Go ahead, get this right here. This is volume one, and then get volume two on June twentieth. But you know, when I wrote, um, shout out to Eric Mason, who who was the one who spearheaded and edited uh, this work. And one of the things that he emphasized uh, for all the authors is that um, our our sources need to be impeccable. We need to have everything need to be well sourced. You know, Eric Mason was very uh, intent about that. You know, and so going into the project, you know, we're like, you know, whatever claim you're making. You need to make sure that unless it's some truly some original idea to you, you know, but if you if you're going to be making claim like making historical claims or in my case, I reference a lot of the philosophical work, um, make sure that you are sourced up. You you, you cite it. Um, I think we did Chicago style. We had our you know, bibliography in notes and so forth. And so um, when you're when you're doing that, it's not like it's not borrowing or like in, in some sort of. Um, uh, what am I trying to think of? Like, it's not like diminishing to your work to be referencing the work of someone else. Like he kind of Valentine makes it seem as though like, oh, it's not new. He's borrowing from like like a lot of other people, as as if it undermines whoever this person's work is. You know I'm saying, but that's not how this you know citations and bibliographies work. Like it actually bolsters the you know the uh, academic credibility of your work if you're citing solid sources, right? And so the reality is, I don't care what. Um, you know, I don't care if you're studying history, biology, philosophy, mathematics, it doesn't matter what area of academia you're in. The the project of putting out of publishing works, it's like everybody, all academics are in like a big conversation, and they're all contributing to that conversation to try to get to the bottom of things. I'm saying so when you put your work out, when you put your book out, it's like that's your contribution to the conversation, but there are times when it's appropriate to acknowledge what other people have said already before you in that conversation. That's kind of how academia works. So, you know, you're not, 
undermining your own work by heavily citing and you know uh, having extensive bibliography where you're citing the works of others. It's not like borrowing in that sense. Like you're just kind of like an under the table kind of a thing. That's that's not how bibliographies work. And so I think the, the way that I took it in terms of what he said, it seemed like he was, you know, um, whoever the, the, you know, the author, I can't remember the, the guy's name, but he was referencing them borrowing in a way that kind of undermines, well, it's not original. Right. He's right. borrowing from a lot of other people, but he but he cites it. It's like that's not how this that's not how academia goes. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it's not like the only way your work is credible is if everything you say is original to you and it and somehow you're undermined by borrowing from other people. I think he just he clearly doesn't understand how academia works. And and he cuts his or nose seems to. to despite his face because he just referenced two sources. That's so true. Should <laughs> yeah. that diminish his attempt now to talk it about should. things? Right? Right. Well, let okay. me just say, let me say this to that crowd that he's talking to. And that was this video was published like back in the day. But to that crowd, if I was to go uh, in front of his crowd and give a very academic, robust lecture with me citing my sources as I go, uh, you know, William Lane Craig says, blah, blah, blah. Adam Coleman in his in his chapter on black atheism said that would make me look like. I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's it's dis, it's dysfunctional. And I'm not look, I love I, I love the people. I love the community. I love the culture. But you but you gotta come with a certain sense of ownership and bravado for these cats to listen to you. And if you come up in there citing sources, they take it as if you don't even know what you're talking about because you don't have ownership of the information. And that's just not true. The very fact that you, in, in academia, the very fact that you can reference this material, number one, you're just giving credit what credit is due. And number two, what is the quality of your sources? Is these uh, primary sources or is these secondary sources or are these bootleg sources? No, facts. That's facts, right. And I, I appreciate the fact that he is citing sources because you know me. You know, if you're gonna start a source, I I I, I look for it, and you know. So he mentioned Hilton Holtema, right? And this is his book, Mystery Man of the Bible. And in this book, this is what he says: uh, By these facts of history, facts of history, okay, we learn when we at what period of time the story of the alleged crucifixion of Christ was formulated. We see that this story did not appear in the Bible until the year 680 A.D. <laughs> Come on, man. Time wait, out. wait, Time wait. <laughs> wait, wait. Let me finish. Time, man. Time out, bro. Let me finish. Jesus. <laughs> man, all right. Finish. Okay, my fault. Hold my fault. Go ahead. My fault. Hold hold on, hold <laughs> for, for 1,600 years, the church, after it was founded in 325 A.D., has taught that Jesus was not only a man, a great man, the greatest who ever lived, but that he was the savior of mankind and wash us from our sins in his own blood. It is strange that a man so great should have no history at all outside of the New Testament. It appears the only reason why the New Testament was written was to bring this savior into being and give him some semblance of history. Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> I can't talk, bro. I'm this. I'm this. <laughs> man, come on, man. Like, yo, I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, we, we've all heard, you know, the Council of Nicaea thing. I, I'm serious. I, I'm having trouble talking. This is hilarious, though. So, we, we've all heard, you know, how Jesus created at the Council of Nicaea and all that garbage. This man, he he's like, yo, I see you at 325 AD, and I will raise you <laughs> 680. <laughs> He's yo, I'm, I, I got. I mean, come on, man. So first of all, I mean, you know, I, now Grant, I don't know when that book was written. When was that book written? The the myth of the. Do you know when? It was oh, written? I have no okay. idea. I don't know the date. Oh, okay. Well, either way, I mean, come on, man. He said there's no uh, history, no uh, history, no mention at all. <laughs> so at all. Go out, Tac Tacitus, Suetonius, all, all of the historical sources outside of the scriptures. That even even secularists, you know, historians reference as being 
credible historical references, you know, to to G, to to a real Jesus. We're just gonna throw all those out, but oh no, there's no history of him outside of the Bible. So, so scratch t- Tacitus, uh, both Josephus t- uh, passages, uh, Suetonius, uh, Pliny the Younger. You know, I mean, all, all that. We're just gonna throw all that out. You know what I mean? It, I mean, again, first of all, let, let's remember that uh, th- that uh, Phil Valentine referred to this as an excellent work. Like he emphatically says this is an excellent work, right? And already we see something that's so, you know, pseudo. I, I don't honestly, man, I don't even think most cats in the comics community today would even would even believe that, bro. Like I, I really maybe a few cats. I don't I, I don't think he could get away with that today. I maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't I don't know what y'all think, man. But six eighty, okay. man. That's that's crazy, bro. <laughs> six eighty, seventh century. Never First mind. Time you ever P-51. hear about the cross? Never, never mind the John, you know, the 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 P fifty fifty one fragment. You know what I'm saying? And all right, right, P fifty two. I'm sorry, the P fifty two. P fifty two. Never mind the fragment that that was, you know, and all the other uh, you know, fragments that we found from the New Testament way before six eighty. You know saying like way right. before six eighty. Scratch all that, Meg. All right, Meg. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's it's like you said earlier. Some things just don't warrant a response. We can keep going. <laughs> that was quick. So, right, 680, right? So we don't know anything about Jesus dying and raising from the dead until 7th century AD, according to that book that he's referencing from, right? Well, uh, Gerd Ludeman, atheist New Testament professor at Göttingen, quote, the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus, not later than three years. The formation of the appearance traditions mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, falls into the time between 30 and 33 CE. But this guy's talking 7th century. So wait, wait, 33, 30 to 33 CE, is, is that before or after 680 AD? I just want to... <laughs> I think it's a little before. He's got a, a ballpark. Before. It's a little bit before <laughs> 680. He's got a ballpark. A little bit before 680. It's a little. It's a smidge. <laughs> yeah. Um, and to your yeah. point, Adam, right? He said there's no history outside of the Gospels about Jesus, right? And we can't get into all of it, but you mentioned most of these guys. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Celsius, Josephus, the Talmud, Dallas, Tacitus, Bar Seraphon. Yeah, right, yeah. I mean... These guys are not in the Bible. Right. None of these guys. And we got hostile witnesses to Jesus as well. So that's right. No history, really? Now he mentions a second book, right? Deceptions and Myths of the Bible by Lloyd M. Graham. Now, actually, this is the book he says it's an excellent work. Oh, okay. So this is the one we said was actually. This is the book. Okay. okay. All right. Fair enough. With Graham, we face a very different set of issues, as in place of Kutner's ignorant bluster or Boston Bark's outmoded esoteria, we are faced with Graham's rather substandard grasp of reality. In fact, <laughs> Gra- Graham's book is a goldmine of unattended humor not seen since the days of Godfrey Higgins. He begins by stating that the Earth was once a sun and the sun will one day be a planet, and that much of the Bible is an allegorical retelling of such transformations. All of this, Graham claims, is part of the ancient wisdom, which so far as anyone can tell, has only been revealed to Lloyd M. Graham. He later gives evidence in the form of an alleged etymological connections, but derives them using the words of English translations rather than the Greek and Hebrew in which they were actually written. But this is an excellent work. <laughs> Wait a minute. Excellent work. It, okay, is, yeah. is, he, is he going for a son, S-O-N, and son, yes. S-U-N? He does that, yeah. Oh, uh, that's a great argument. It's, it's worse, though. That's next all, level planets right there, all, that all planets were sons. All planets were sons. All planets were once sons. And we were, at, and we also were sons at one point. Not S-O-N. Oh, wow. S-U-N. Okay. Yeah, it, it's wild. So wow. this is an Ooh. excellent work. Good stuff. Yeah. I can't I can't refute it. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. This is what man, this is one of them joints, man, where somebody you sitting back getting high or something like that. I'm like, man, let me just write down whatever comes, man. That's what that sounds like, bro. 
So I, I, I guess like. I guess African Christians who who Bible was translated in gays, right? Mm. Would this apply to them, Alfredo? I... Would, they, would they have to adopt the white man's English translations? Wow! Oh snap! Ooh, ooh! Shots fired! Placow! <laughs> wow! So but but right, they, they, you know the sun s u n s o n right? Yeah, that's great in English, <laughs> right? Like right. Lazarus is L Osiris, and yeah, it sounds great in English. You know, but if you go back to the original scripts, yeah, no, nah, you don't you don't make the same connection, buddy. Mm, mm, mm. And you don't know science. He might have been better off borrowing from Malachi as York for real. He might, <laughs> I mean, he might as well. I mean, it, it's just as bad. <laughs> I don't, now remember, yeah, twenty years. <laughs> twenty years of investigative research. Right. And these are what he's referencing. These are great books. Can we keep tabs? Because, like, cause I'm really trying to figure out in that 20 years how you get theocracy wrong, total total misunderstanding of vicarious uh, atonement. Atonement. Um, you also are, also know are, the word contention from conviction. Contention from conviction. You're citing a work you, that you believe to be credible, wherein somebody claims that <laughs> there's no history of Jesus before 325 and. It was all started in 680 AD and so forth. And you also are citing a work which you believe to be an excellent work where the dude is teaching that their sons uh, were planets or will become planets, was it? Or, or vice versa, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, I'm pretty sure some cosmologists would take issue with that. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, I don't think you can walk into any you know establishment of higher learning and say these things without somebody saying, hey, man, if shrooms... They, they might feel real good to you, but you got to lay off, my guy. You, you got to lay off the <laughs> trim, dude. Oh, man. Man. The new. The reefer edition. edition of the century. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, that's not. Crazy. But all right, let's go. Let's go to um, the 18 minute mark now. Man, do we have to? that they have yes. to follow one person as a form of. Those of you who follow the Bible must know that the Bible, as it is now presently used, is a book of the church. It is not a book of God. The Jewish church stands behind the Old Testament, and the Christian church, or the Catholic church, stands behind the New. And behind both churches is the priesthood. Know you that the priesthood is just like the Congress of the United States. It's about power. All priesthoods, excuse me, are about power. <laughs> Boy, drink it out of a gallon of water. Years of the table. <laughs> Anyone who consolidates a thought process or consolidates truth into a belief context is about consolidating power over you. And this has been beaten into you for over three to five hundred years. Anytime you call Jesus your savior, it is because by calling upon his name, the lash didn't come down upon you. So you were saved an ass whipping. And that alone is the context for your belief because you did not call God Jesus. You never call God Jesus. This is something that was beaten into your genetic context. This is something that was a learned experience, not something that evolved by your participation in nature. As nature gives you everything, including... <laughs> I feel like I've been laughing this whole time. Let me chill out, man. <laughs> I feel like after every clip, I'm just like... Oh, man. This well, wild, right off man. the bat, He's already um, self-refuting, right? Because he says anything that consolidates information to a belief system is wrong. But he got all this information that he wrote in his little piece of paper that he co consolidated for his tape series. <laughs> right. So that means you're dangerous too, right? Because I mean, I'm assuming thing. he expects people to believe what he's saying. Right? Yes. Oh no, they'll they'll <laughs> say no. They'll believe no. Oh, fair. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Oh man. So, yeah, this is terrible, bro. This is terrible. I mean, so it's just like it, it just is, man. I mean, again, he keep going back to the, the these suit. I was, I was just about to say, beaten into your genetic context. What in the world does that sound mean? sexy? Sounds yeah, it, sexy. it sounds great. Again, using words and ways that they were never meant to be used, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, I think you do have, um, and, and uh, Dino can correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a. Um, a school of thought, I guess you could say that that I think I think the term is epigenetics. You know, where there could be some sort of uh, trauma or some sort of happenings in one's life that can impact, you know, what they pass down genetically or, or something like that. You know, I mean, I think there's I don't know how well um, established it is or or not, but I, I will say that to say it from what I know of it, it certainly doesn't. It is not so specific that it would be like a specific idea, as in like Jesus. You know is your savior like that specific idea is not encoded in your genetics like it, it's right in principle that that's just impossible <laughs> it's impossible for, for that sort of thing to be encoded right. in your genetics and, but um and, and there's I, I seriously doubt he was even you know referencing all that i think i'm giving him more credit okay okay gotcha you know thanks d she said epigenetics is a thing you know but the idea that a specific belief you know would be beaten into you and somehow ingraining your gen- genetic code that way i yeah, you know, I think that's that's taking the epigenetics and going like that's like epigenetics on crack or steroids, I guess. That, and you know, that's, that's the only way we know about Jesus. Adam. The only way, right? The only way, you know. Never mind the fact that you know, as Vince Bantu has pointed out, we have evidence of Christians in West Africa um, believing in Christianity prior to. Um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, prior to uh, the transatlantic slave trade, I think I got the same book behind me right now. There you go. There we go. MJ got it too. Corpus of early Arabic sources for West African uh, African history. Um, I've actually cited this in, my, in a video on my channel as well, where you have um, a, a source reporting that Mansa Musa himself acknowledged there being Christians in his kingdom. You know, uh, this would have been back in like the 1300s or so. So you know, definitely before yeah. the transatlantic slave trade. Um, but that being said, funny enough, actually, a lot of times we talk about the genetic fallacy. So the genetic fallacy is where you try to um you try to refute a belief or a claim based on how somebody came to believe it you know that's just fallacious thinking you know because somebody could come to believe something under suspicious or or suspect means but nevertheless the belief itself is true so if you if you're trying to debunk somebody's belief or claim on the basis of how they came to believe it that's just that's just genetic fallacy it's a fallacious way of going about that right this is act, this is almost like literally the genetic fallacy because he's saying that the re- the only reason that you believe that Jesus is your savior is because it was beaten into your genetics, and so that's where that belief arises from. You know, going back to your know, ancestors and so forth. You know what I'm saying? This is this is actually like the genetic fallacy, but even more, um, even more like literally, I guess you know, li- literally right. taken. You know, right? So he, he's as, as fallacious as fallacious can be. You know. MJ? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we got evidence that uh, Christian, oh, that slaves, black people, were beaten uh, because they were praying, because they yep. were calling on Jesus. I mean, yep. we have evidence exactly. that points to the opposite direction. Uh, we also have, you know, evidence, uh, as we pointed out, the, of Christians in West Africa paying the jizya. Right, mm, mm-hmm. and that might be a word that go over uh, Phil Valentine's head, but the jizya is a special tax where uh, countries who are under uh, Islamic rule they basically tax people who are not Muslims, and so these Christians were were paying the jizya. But uh, I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna get get this type of teaching, this good type of teaching in the, in right. a six hour session, listening to uh, Phil Valentine bloviate. <laughs> but I think that's why he had to. Uh, he started coughing, had to get that that gallon, that jug of water. I think all that hot air coming out of him ah. dried, he dried out his vocal cords. He had to he had to rehydrate. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> but you know, soul. again, twenty years <laughs> of investigative <laughs> research. Right. So we only knew Christ because of we were oppressed into knowing Christ, hmm. which is odd because. By the early second century, Christianity had spread from Palestine into Egypt and along the North African coast. The area belonged to the Roman Empire, where Hellenistic and Roman deities were worshipped alongside local deities. 
oppressive Roman rule led many North Africans to embrace Christianity as an act of dissent. Mm. Let me say that again. Wow. Oppressive Roman rule led many North Africans to embrace Christianity as an act of dissent. After religion expanded, churches sprang up, affiliated to larger bodies overseen by bishops. This is from the Black History book by David Osoga. So, so we, this completely contradicts what he's saying. <laughs> right, right. You know. Oh, not to mention the fact that, I mean, you know, and I just want to highlight and emphasize what MJ said, <clears throat> you know, when it comes to, um, I mean, we have enslaved persons in their own words attesting to the fact that they would get beaten for uh, attending hush harbors. I'm saying hush harbors were where slaves were under the, the dark of night would go away to a, like a, an area in the woods <clears throat> and they would have their own independent worship services. But if they got caught, they could get, you know, severely beaten for that, you know, or even killed. You know what I mean? So, but you know, the patrollers would come out and wreck shop if they were worshiping Jesus independently, you know? So right. we, it, so again, in these 20 years of intense study, I'm trying to figure out how, you know, Dr. Val, you know, Dr. Valentine didn't come across these enslaved persons whose account directly contradicts what he's saying because he's saying they, they're, they said in their own words, at least some of them, they got beat for, you know, seeking after Christ, right? Uh, and then you have other slave uh, owners whom we know prevented the preaching of of Christianity to the slaves because under English common law. As America's kind of getting started, this that's kind of where we have our legal, um, that's kind of like our legal predecessor, if you will. You know, we inherited much from English common law. Right. And, you know, early in, you know, the colonial period, moving into America being a nation, like, yo, like, if you were a Christian, you weren't supposed to be enslaved, you know, at least by the right. law. But as right. you have Africans proclaiming Christ, getting baptized and so forth, on that basis, they were, argue, you know, arguing even in courts. You know, I'm thinking about the Thomas Gage right. case, uh, the Judge Thomas Gage. Um you know, to for for their freedom on the basis of having been baptized and, and right. being Christians, and so therefore you had, <clears throat> excuse me, you have slave masters um, who opposed the preaching of the of of the gospel to the slaves, enslaved persons, because well, if you don't preach the gospel to them, then they can't become Christian. If they can't become Christian, they have to worry about setting them free. Right. Um, you know, shout out to you know Jew Three Project and, and my guy Don Carey. Uh, I was a part of a documentary called Unspoken that's available right now on uh, Amazon Prime. And we get into all this. You know what I'm saying like it's, it's two hours of of actual history. You know, what I'm saying? With, you know that can that can be supported by actual primary sources where we address this very issue. You know, well, to both your points, here's one of the slave narratives right here. Uh, this is from Adeline Cunningham, age 85, enslaved in in Texas, born in slavery. She says, "Nah, sir, we never goes to church." Times we sneaks in the woods and praise the Lord to make us free. And times one of the slaves got happy and made a noise that they heard at the big house. And then the overseer came and whipped us because we prayed the Lord to set us free. Wow. So, yeah, they got whipped. Wow. But they get whipped into Jesus. They got whipped because they wanted Jesus to free them. Mm. But you got 20 years of investigative um methodology right 20 years 20 years 20 years, 20 years. and there's several quotes like this like he like valentine to for, in order for his theory to work he has to trample on you know these ancestors right here these these forefathers and foremothers wow. like you know adeline cunningham he's got to trample upon them and their account and just disregard them which right. to me is the most white supremacist thing you can do like we're not even worried about what y'all saying we're just, we just gonna take y'all off the books and, and, and wow. entirely uh, that sounds like some of white supremacists would do, but that's kind of the approach that he's taking in order to make his theory work. Right. It's deep, man. It's deep. MJ? <laughs> he's he's good. He's, he's so, dumbfounded. <laughs> and actually, I think with that, I think we're gonna we're gonna leave it right here, guys. I think we've okay. we've, we've done enough. <laughs> Let, let me just say I'm getting no in the towel for Rod <laughs> Muhammad vibes about Brother Phil Valentine. Oh boy. There's been rumors of that. There's certainly been rumors that, you know, his pigmentation has been under suspicion. I'll, say it, I'll put it that way. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have no actual proof of that. But it's been whispered that, you know, he's not, you know, 
He's not drenched in the sun as many mm. of us are. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. But again, and how scary is this? He is one of the grand master teachers of the conscious community. Yeah. The grand wizard. That's wild, you know, bro. That's wild. He strawmans misinformation, misunderstanding the word, the definition of words. But it sounds really dope when he says it, though. Keith Murray. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Actually, I like Keith Murray. Keith, Keith Murray is one of my favorite rappers back then. No, no, I like him too. I like him. But, <laughs> you know, but, but to your point, though, he, he there's a lot of he makes the gobbledygook of vocabulary sound really dope. <laughs> right. You know, which right, is his right, style, right. which is fine yeah. as an MC, not as a theologian, though. No, not at all, not at all. And so here's the thing, like, and, and I'm not saying this to, you know, make myself seem like whatever. I'm I'm just communicating my experience. Like for me, you know, contributing to the Urban Apologetics book was was extremely formative for me in terms of how I go about doing what I'm doing. You know, because you know, when you're putting out like published work, like for real, for real. Like it's a very like rigorous process. Like you can't be sloppy with your sources and stuff like that. You can't be quoting, you know, like you know, you can't put like uh, something in the bibliography and think it's gonna slide. You know, you can't just make something up. Like you know, they go back and they check your sources. You know what I'm saying like if you put something down, you cite somebody, they're gonna go back and look and make sure right, that right. your citations are in order. It's a very thorough process. You know what I mean? And so I think that um, much of the conscious community has grown up on a diet. Of Phil Valentine's pseudo scholarship, where nobody's really going back and checking any claims. Like nobody's really going back and saying, "Well, okay, well you cited, you know, this or that source." Oh, well, dang! But then when we look at that source, there's, there's clear, egregious historical errors. Like nobody's really, you know, following the breadcrumbs of his so-called scholarship. You know, so I think honestly, and y'all let me know what y'all think. I know we about to get out of here, but I think sometimes, like when we show up. You know, whether it be on a side letter or in some sort of thread or something like that, and we're pointing out these mistakes. I feel like we're we're pointing out stuff like nobody's ever heard before in that community. Like I think many of them, if they sit down and listen to this, they've never heard this stuff. With the exception, I, I will give credit where credit is due. Somebody like a you know a brother Ankh, you know what I'm saying, or Garfield in their community. I think those would be examples of people who recognize how trash, um, uh, you know, uh, Valentine's pseudo scholarship is, but. I think for the most part, I think I think Brother Ankh and Garfield are probably exceptions. Like they themselves would probably come under scrutiny for critiquing somebody like uh, a Valentine. I, I don't know what y'all think. You know, no, I, I agree with you. I just think that they have uh, they they have been conditioned to operate, you know, with a bad epistemology. I mean, you already hear him saying things like belief versus no. Um, you know, you can't know anything unless you believe it, right? That's just your right. psychological disposition uh, toward the, the object of your belief. So uh, I, I think it's, I, I think they have been conditioned to believe certain things. And it's, it's sad. And then when we come along and point it out, like we just pointing out that the sources that they are using, these these are not even these are, this is not even good testimony. So much of uh, our epistemology is based on testimony, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to 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 make knowledge claims, the testimony that these that these guys are relying on has to be true, and we're just pointing out that it's not true based on uh, historical facts. So, like, what do you do with that? Right. And and you know uh, the other side of the coin is. We point these things out and they still hold to it. I think I heard Sonetta say, um, you know, when, when they were talking about a debate between Garfield and uh, Jabari, that his mind is already made up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not some for, for a lot of people. It's not a knowledge issue. It's a hard issue. It's not. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we're just simply here to leave them without excuse, to be perfectly honest. We're just simply here to tear down strongholds and expose the hard issues. Right. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I mean, yeah, people like Garfield, right, who definitely call Phil Valentine pseudo uh, and Gerald Massey and all that. And he mm -hmm. gets ostracized in his own community because of that. Right. 
you know, because he and, and and mind you, he also doesn't agree with Christianity. But with him, it's like we need a more robust critique if we're gonna, you know, take down Christianity. And that's yeah. what he's trying to develop. And his side doesn't want to hear any of that because they love, they love the black hegemony that they've created for themselves. And you know, and to be fair, like I think you know, there's a couple of different. There's like a sociological side to it. I mean, the reality is, you know, when you take a people group, you know, like African Americans, and you make real systemic moves, you know, to deprive them of levels of education. You know what I'm saying? Like there, were, there have been real right. educational barriers um, to many, if not most, in the black community. I'm just thinking historically. You know what I'm saying? That that's been an issue, right? Um, so when you do that, and then you know, if you couple that with, um, so if you keep black people you know, at bay as much as you can academically and then you couple that with an overarching notion in society that black people are dumb that they're not as valuable that you know they're not intellectual and so forth and you know unfortunately most african americans have been detached from the pockets of academia that you know and, and academics that we have had to be able to rise up like when you do all that then it makes it easy to see why the the the, the casual phil valentine watcher would want him to be a, a, a an academic heavyweight you know what i'm saying like they want him to be a master teacher you know what i'm saying like right, they, right. there's a thirst there for it because that sort of thing has been denied to us in, you know, in many respects you know a, as a people so i understand you know why somebody would be attracted to listen to somebody like a dr phil valentine a brother who's putting words together and you know saying something deep you know what i mean i i get it you know what i mean but at some point we have to we have to grow up as a community you know what I mean? We have to, as we are, are uh, accessing more information, and, and as he re references logic and reason, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what we're all about. Like, you know, we, we didn't sit up here and just say, oh, well, the Bible tells me so, therefore Christianity is, is true, and therefore Valentine is false. Like, you know, at the points where you were um, referencing scripture, you were doing so to point out where he had misrepresented what the scriptures say and what Christians right. believe. Right. That's totally appropriate. That's not the that's not trying to use the Bible to prove the Bible or none of that. You're pointing out where he's strawmanning by going to the text. It's totally right. appropriate. So as we're able to do, do these things, at some point you got to leave the Valentines alone, man. At some point you gotta you gotta grow up. You know what I'm saying? And and I get it. I understand like the 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 draw, but come on, man. You know, foolery is foolery, no matter how you dress it up, no matter how many nice words you put around it, it's foolishness, man. Facts. MJ, your, your final thoughts on this matter, sir. Yeah, uh, I agree with so much of what Adam just said. And I think a separate show, we could talk about just the black eye that people like uh, Valentine, people like Henry Clark, uh, Ben, have given mm -hmm. to African-American studies departments. Wow. The, le the legitimacy of, of African-American or black studies is being like mocked. Wow. amongst professors in a, in academia it is because you you bring garbage like this wow it it, it becomes a joke mm -hmm. it becomes yeah, a joke about that. that's a good point like seriously that's a very good point you, you have affirmative action going before the supreme court and some of their evidence is the african american studies department wow Dang. well the africana studies department well, you have a look, yeah, most definitely the African. <laughs> wow. But this wow. mess. I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. That's 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 deep. That's deep. That's yeah. a whole nother different show. Now, me, me and MJ have definitely discussed a little bit of that on the show, you know, especially in New York and Hunter College during the, the, the mm -hmm. mid 90s, the Africana studies with Professor Leonard Jeffries, you know, a lot a lot of these guys yeah, yeah. were given passes to teach at Cornell and at Hunter College and I I mean like legitimate universities which legitimizes yeah. what they teach. That's why it's so much harder for us to refute this because who's going to deny their tuition based education? Like yeah. I paid to learn this. How can it be wrong? <laughs> right, right, right. Right. So That's we wild. get that. Good, good, good point, MJ. Good That's point. a great point, MJ. Yeah. But um, before we close out though, uh, I want to share the next installment in our is this your king series uh -oh. we we will be addressing dr ben and adam i don't know if you're free wednesday night 
But, you know, if you want to jump in, feel free. Adam, Dr. Ben is very fun. You might have fun with him, too. I know it, man. It, it depends. I'm supposed to be going to somebody's home for dinner. But if I can get out. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, we'll yeah. talk. All right, cool. So, yes, yeah, so that will be this Wednesday at 9 p.m. East Coast time. All right, gentlemen. So, with that being said, it is True ID, MJ, and BK signing off. Peace. Thank you.